There is no escape from climate change. It influences where we can live, our health, our economy, our art and music, and our overall quality of life. Controls on climate and weather, underlying mechanisms of change, human and ecological impacts, and their implications cannot be defined by a simple disciplinary description. Rather, climate change calls for, if not demands, multi- and interdisciplinary approaches that include physical, chemical, biological, and social dimensions and feedback. The climate and environment of Maine have changed dramatically in the last several thousand years. Melting ice sheets have forced the evolution of sea level, lakes, and rivers. Forests and animals have migrated into and out of the region. Agriculture and industry have emerged. Population distribution has changed. Cultural patterns and socioeconomic complexity have changed. Energy and transportation needs have increased. Air and water quality have changed. And Maine's interaction with national and global economies and the changing dynamics of security has intensified dramatically. Woven within all of that is that climate change and the realization by the scientific community, the White House and the Pentagon and governments around the world that climate change is among the most serious and ever-present security issues on the planet. Assessing Maine's place in the security web is essential to planning for Maine's future. Climate change has been identified as a signature area of excellence at the University of Maine. The signature designation reflects the exceptional quality of research as well as the international reputation of the Climate Change Institute. Climate change at the University of Maine includes integrated undergraduate and graduate educational opportunities and integrated service products that are dedicated to improving the well-being of the university, the state, the nation, and the world. One of the most relevant contributions to society that can be made by a land-grant research university such as the University of Maine is to translate findings and tools into transparent templates that can be applied to understanding major societal concerns and to serve as a basis for action. One of the biggest security threats faced by society and ecosystems is the speed and variability of climate change in the 21st century with informed adaptation to climate change essential for our future. Maine, the nation, and the world are currently engaged in a massive, evolving effort to develop climate adaptation and sustainability plans, ranging in scale from grassroots to the highest levels of government. The University of Maine is well positioned to provide expertise in support of climate adaptation and sustainability plans because of the unique multidisciplinary temporal and spatial perspective offered by the Climate Change Institute and the Institute's academic and research partners here on campus. In Maine, there is a rapidly emerging interest in CLAS or class planning, ranging from small communities and municipalities to non-governmental organizations, private industry, and state government. The Climate Change Institute and partners produced Maine's first climate assessment report in 2009 entitled Maine's Climate Future as well as several web-based tools that provide baseline information concerning physical climate, the Climate Reanalyzer, and Air Quality, 10 Green. These resources and others can be used in planning and development and to complement existing monitoring networks that provide climate change specificity for impacts on terrestrial, freshwater, urban, and marine ecosystems. We expect that our developing approach to building a class plan is unique and that the timing of this initiative is coincident with the burgeoning needs of society in the area of adaptation and sustainability. This initiative could, as a consequence, gain considerable momentum at the national and international scale, and we look forward to playing a leadership role. Today's meeting involves more than 200 participants from throughout Maine, notably town planners, policymakers, community groups, and NGOs. It will build on emerging collaborations between the Climate Change Institute and its many partners, both on campus, throughout Maine, and beyond. And together, we will contribute to a greater understanding of the interactions within the global climate system. And now, it is a really a very distinct pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who was really the first speaker. <laughs> Dr. Paul Andrew Majewski is director and professor of the Climate Change Institute at the University of Maine and has academic affiliations with the University School of Earth and Climate Sciences and the School of Policy and International Affairs. An internationally acclaimed scientist and explorer, 
He has led more than 50 expeditions to some of the remotest reaches of the planet, including many field seasons traveling across previously unexplored regions of the Antarctic, many first descents of mountains and high altitude climbs in the Himalayas and the Andes. He has more than 350 publications and two popular books, uh, The Ice Chronicles and Journey into Climate. His contributions to science include discovery of human impacts on the chemistry of the atmosphere, modern Antarctic and Himalayan ice loss, abrupt climate change, and the impact of climate change on past civilizations. He has received numerous honors, including the first ever internationally awarded Medal for Excellence in Antarctic Research, the International Glaciological Society Seligman Crystal, and the Explorers Club Lowell Thomas Medal. He has developed several highly prominent international research programs in Antarctica, Greenland, and Asia, and public outreach efforts with organizations such as the American Museum of Natural History and the Boston Museum of Science, and has appeared literally hundreds of times in the media, most recently on Showtime's Emmy Award-winning climate change series, Years of Living Dangerously. So please join me in a very warm welcome for Dr. Majewski. Thank you so much, President Hunter. It's, uh, it's really uh, uh, a privilege to have uh, President Hunter and, Pro and Provost Hecker here at this very important period for the University of Maine, the University of Maine system. This is a time when we, uh, we want people who are highly competent to help us uh, chart the future. Uh, when we decided to put this meeting together, the class conference, uh, there was no doubt at all, as President Hunter mentioned, that uh, climate change had gotten to a very, very high level. Uh, it's clearly identified as a major uh, security issue with respect to health, the ecosystem, catastrophes, geolitic, geopolitical, the economy, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> so this is, a, and Maine, of course, uh, is a place that is deeply affected because of our resources, tourism, the things that we do in this state, as is the rest of the world, and it's important uh, to plan for the future. There are three things that are typically discussed with respect to climate change. One is mitigation, the second is adaptation, and the third is sustainability. We're not talking about mitigation at this conference, not because we don't think it's important. It is critically important. But we're trying to focus on providing tools for people uh, and planning uh, possibilities uh, for the inevitable. The inevitable in which we have to adapt over the next couple of decades. We've already experienced very, very dramatic changes in the Arctic, uh, which have affected Maine without a doubt. So uh, we're fortunate at the University of Maine and the University of Maine system to have this amazing uh, breadth of experience with respect to climate change. We thought that this would be a really good time to not just showcase this, but more importantly, share it with everybody uh, and demonstrate the university's interest in working with as many groups as possible. In this particular conference, we're focusing on Maine communities. Our intent is to take the very same system and extrapolate it to nations, uh, states, nations, etc. If you take a look at the existing climate adaptation and sustainability plans, uh, carefully, you'll find out that they're obviously all very valuable, uh, and we believe that ours adds significant uh, value to many of the existing ones because it provides tools and it provides a planning process, uh, which is very, very different than the other climate adaptation and sustainability plans. So uh, the conference is set up. You've seen enough of me there. Uh, the conference is set up so that... Uh, We'll start with uh, an introduction by Ivan Fernandez, and I'll, I'll introduce him in more detail in a minute, uh, to where we've gone, uh, and largely where Ivan and his colleagues have gone with respect to updating Maine's climate future. Maine's climate future came out uh, in 2009. It was a critical document. I'm sure everybody's familiar with it. Uh, but it was out of date, it, and it needed changes. So you will hear a lot about those changes. Uh, from there, uh, we'll go on to a description of the tools uh, that have been developed by the Climate Change Institute, and in particular, our partners in the School of uh, Computing and Information. Uh, several graduate students, one of which is Mark Royer, who's sitting here, uh, Eric Albert, uh, 
and, and others in particular. Uh, and this will focus on the work largely done by Sean Burkle. He's put everything together. I'll introduce him in more detail. Uh, there'll be a video uh, that you can watch. I should mention that everything at this conference is going to be put on a on the web, but this video will actually be on YouTube. It's about 25, 30 minutes long, and it's a great tutorial because there's tremendous depth to these tools, and we want people to be able to use them easily. We'll then go on to a presentation by Esperanza Stancia, who is well known, I think, to, very, to a lot of people for the work that she's done in organizing communities uh, and in helping us to understand how to interpret monitoring, how to con uh, conduct monitoring experiments. Uh, and how to see whether or not change uh, is occurring and what, it's, and what sort of change is occurring. Uh, from then on, then we have lunch, obviously a time for everybody to get together and, and meet each other more. That's a large part of this meeting. Uh, then we move on to uh, Caroline Noblet, uh, a, uh, a young uh, early career professor in economics who will talk a lot about why uh, we look at climate change the way we do, uh, and also the incentives behind adapting and, and basically sustainability. Uh, and then we'll, the last of the presentations will be give, given by John Mann from the Business School, and he's going to present something which in addition to the tools and the presentations is also very different, a very different way that you haven't seen in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and even other adaptation programs a very different way for uh, visualizing what might happen in the future and planning for the future. Following that, we have uh, three breakout sessions. There'll be some introduction before that. Uh, this is largely being coordinated by Misha Saros. He'll be introduced, as will the other moderators for those sessions, uh, in which you'll get hands-on experience starting to develop climate adaptation and scenario uh, and uh, sustainability plans for uh, coastal Maine, uh, Central Maine and Northern Maine. So that's a quick overview of the meeting. We'll try to get this all done by about 5 o'clock. The weather's not good. I'm sure everybody needs to go other places. Uh, but we're very interested in what you think about this meeting. And Cindy uh, Eisenhower uh, has put together a uh, survey of this meeting. Many of you no doubt filled this in already. Uh, and we hope that when you get the, uh, the follow-up to this that Cindy is sending out, that you will also fill this out. It'll be a great help in us, for us to understand how, in fact, uh, how successful we've been, whether we've covered the right points, were there major holes, major things that we left out, and how do we refine this further and further. Why? Uh, because we have a website. Uh, the class website under the Climate Change Institute that you can go to, and as we get better and better in this process, with your help, we'll make this website better and better. Uh, let me just introduce uh, Cindy. You see her, her picture here so that you can actually come up to her uh, during the conference, but we want you to know, uh, have an, an in-depth understanding of the people that you're going to be dealing with. Uh, Cindy Eisenhower is an assistant professor of anthropology and cooperating faculty in the Climate Change Institute. Her research is focused on the cultural determinants of environmental risk perception and policy formulation. She has conducted ethnographic field work in the US, Scandinavia, and China, and is currently working on a research project that traces the development of policy designed uh, to address the emissions embodied in international trade. Again, another demonstration that we have an amazing powerhouse of resources in terms of people uh, at the institution. So please be sure to, if you have, whoops, I guess we missed one there. Okay, please be sure to, uh, if you haven't already, uh, to uh, be involved in this conference uh, survey. It's very important to us and it'll help us to make this better, this whole program a lot better. So, the, uh, the next speaker uh, and a person who has been involved in uh, climate change, environmental change, monitoring for a great deal of time is Professor Ivan Fernandez. Uh, let me just say a couple of quick words about Ivan from a personal point of view before I formally introduce him. Uh, Ivan is the, uh, in many ways, the, uh, the, the, the blood that keeps an awful lot of things together uh, between the university related to climate and environmental change, the state, 
uh, and all sorts of stakeholders. I'm sure many of you have seen him give presentations all over the state. Uh, the report that he developed along with uh, George Jacobson and Catherine Schmidt, who's in the audience, Maine's Climate Future, uh, it was a first. It was the first such document prov uh, provided for a state. Uh, it had great breadth, and he's taken the last few months with many colleagues, many of the same colleagues who put together Maine's Climate Future, to develop an update, which is critically important. A lot has changed in the last five years since that 2009 report came out. It's not that it was wrong by any means. In fact, everything that was in there made perfect sense. We simply know much more, and we've seen dramatically more change uh, since then. This is a man who has dedicated his entire career at the University of Maine uh, to being integrally involved in this, making sure not only from the research point of view, but also from the outreach and service point of view uh, that this message is there. So let me introduce Ivan formally. Ivan J. Fernandez is professor in the School of Forest Resources and the Climate Change Institute and the School of Food and Agriculture, obviously at the University of Maine. He was made a distinguished Maine professor in 2007 the case Carnegie uh, in Washington, D.C. named him Professor of the Year for Maine in 2008 and was named a fellow in the Soil Science Society of America in 2010, among other awards, many other awards. He has served on U.S. Environmental Protection Agency Science Advisory Board Committees in Washington, D.C. since 1990, represents the University of Maine and the USDA Northeast Climate Hub, and has been involved in leading Maine's climate future assessments. His research focuses on the biogeochemistry of ecosystems in a changing physical and chemical climate, and it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Ivan Fernandez. Everyone hear me? Uh, well, thank you for that very uh, generous introduction, Paul. Um, that doesn't mean I'm smart, because I agreed to follow Paul on the podium. One should never do that, one of our uh, great speakers. Uh, but it is a pleasure to be here. I know I see a lot of familiar faces. Uh, some of you are still drying off from the long drive up uh, I-95. Um, Climate Change Institute is a very influential organization. We have a three to six inch precipitation event uh, scheduled for today uh, <laughs> as a backdrop. But it is a pleasure to be here. Um, as Paul indicated, I've been here for over uh, three decades, and I'm a soil scientist, uh, primarily in forest soils. I study the biogeochemistry of how ecosystems respond to changing environment from everywhere from uh, residuals application to the land, but a lot having to do with our changing chemical and physical climate. And in a practical way, the code for changing chemical climate, one of the Classic examples would be acid rain, uh, and we all know what we uh, think of when we are talking about a, a changing physical climate. Uh, and during that uh, arc of my career uh, as a land-grant uh, scientist, I'm particularly focused on how does my science inform problems in the community, uh, in, uh, in, 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 throughout the state, and then beyond. Uh, as we develop management strategies and as we develop uh, policies, uh, particularly in, in areas uh, like acid rain that's gotten me involved in, uh, from Augusta to Washington, D.C., to Maine's forests and farms and what have you. Um, and in the last decade, increasingly so, um, interested in how uh, the science uh, around climate change uh, has and can inform that process, which brings us all uh, here today. Um, I started by saying I'm a soil scientist, so that means I get to work with uh, fantastic scientists in the Climate Change Institute and throughout campus that are doing studies here and around the world. Um, and I get to interact with a lot of you who are fantastic experts in all of the different things that you do uh, as I watch and learn from you uh, out in communities and uh, in the various natural resource sectors and in, in developing policy. So I'm a lot more a messenger and an observer uh, and a learner as we go through this. Um, and some of what I'm going to present, uh, or what I'm going to present this morning, is uh, talking a little bit about uh, the bridge uh, between what do we know, uh, what can we say in uh, at least general terms, uh, and then what are the things that uh, matter relative to how that informs uh, what we do every day here in, in the state of Maine. 
I'm a good Maine land grant scientist, so I focus a lot on Maine, uh, even though, of course, I think about uh, the, the nation and the world. So without further ado, let me um, spend the next, uh, until he holds up the clamshell, uh, 50 minutes or so talking about um, some of those perspectives. And let me get started by uh, talking a little bit about my perspective of what we think about. Uh, I know what I think about uh, and what I think a lot of us uh, think about uh, as the concept of climate uh, and how that too has changed. And actually it too is changing more rapidly. Uh, and so we start out, I started out as a scientist learning about climate and um, thinking about an axis of precipitation and temperature and you can draw the little orbs and lay out the biomes of the world and take your final exam and you're done, uh, you're good. You know what things are, where they, where they will be found and how to go into the future. But of course, uh, that would be a concept of climate that looks like that and uh, the paleoecologist uh, even knew back then that uh, climate's always changing. So that's not a representation of anything having to do with climate. Probably around 1990, I would suggest the national consciousness uh, after the reauthorization of the Clean Air Act migrated to talking about global change. And sub subsumed within that really was the issue of climate change, but at the time it was a lot about global warming. And so we got smart and we started to think about global warming as uh, things are on the move. Uh, the climate is changing. Um, good. Uh, and I would argue about 10 years ago, um, people, particularly people like Paul Majewski, uh, led us into understanding that there's this other thing that goes on called abrupt climate change. Uh, and there's a lot of activity in the Institute uh, uh, studying that uh, relative to um, both the, science, uh, the um, physical sciences as well as the social sciences. But that means there's triggers in the system that causes ch climate change rather quickly. Uh, and the geologists and the paleoecologists can point out where this has happened over and over again in geologic time. And a lot of the drivers uh, today around the planet uh, suggest that we are moving uh, some of those triggers closer to potentially uh, uh, putting us or, or putting us at greater risk for uh, abrupt climate change. And we may be living it uh, right now. Uh, and then finally, I, I would suggest in the last few years, sort of the arc of time since the main climate future was released that I'll mention and Paul's already mentioned and uh, the president's already mentioned. Um, but we're beginning to really understand in our day-to-day -day work that climate is a really messy thing to deal with. Uh, so that's what climate really looks like. High frequency variability from year to year. Yeah, sort of a trend. Then there's abrupt climate change and holy crow, how do we go about planning? How do we go about figuring out what to do when that's actually the, com uh, the, the concept of climate uh, that we need to work with? And the only thing I've showed you that's real is that. That's March, April, May minimum temperatures here in Orono for the last 100 years. And so those trends actually do exist. So is climate change then a really complex issue, but yet just another uh, environmental issue, uh, another air pollution issue that um, we just need to get past the hump and uh, we'll be all set. Uh, and probably not. Let's take a look at a few uh, 20th century air pollution issues that uh, probably everyone's uh, familiar with. Uh, uh, we can start with lead and uh, gasoline that um, some subset, I hate to gather, a, a, take a guess at the percent, actually remember putting lead and gasoline in their gas tanks. Uh, the rest of you studied it in school, undoubtedly. Um, but the Clean Air Act in, 19, uh, in uh, 1970 and subsequent regs in uh, 1973 um, limited, uh, actually took lead out of gasoline and limited the emissions of, of uh, heavy metals. Uh, our uh, own Senator Muskie led uh, the Clean Air Act, as probably most of you are, are fully aware. Um, and uh, that actually was pretty effective. Uh, as example, this is a, a lovely little lake in um, Acadia National Park, Sargent Mountain Pond. Um, the red circle shows uh, where that um, is approximately. Some of you may have hiked there. Uh, and these are some data from a, a colleague and friend of mine, uh, uh, Steve Norton and uh, George uh, Jacobson, looking at the metal concentrations in the sediment core in the middle of that lake, which record the march of time both as far as physical inputs as well as chemical inputs. Uh, it's about 200 years, and what you see is uh, heavy metal accumulations over that time uh, until the, reauthor or the um, establishment of the Clean Air Act in 1970, uh, and then dramatic improvements. So, gosh, um, yeah, all the metals aren't out of the environment. Um, we can find them in our forests. We've done that in my own program. Um, but we're way better off because of smart environmental policy. 
CFCs and ozone, uh, stratospheric ozone, the stuff that keeps ultraviolet rays from re increasing our risk of, uh, of cancer. Uh, a problem where we came together internationally in 1987, the Montreal Protocol limited CFCs, which were chemically destroying that stratospheric ozone. Um, and sure enough, um, this is just a plot that shows the, uh, the decline in the air column of, uh, of ozone and the limiting of uh, CFCs caused that decline to halt, uh, turn around and start to, uh, start to improve. And so another example of uh, appropriate environmental uh, policies. Uh, and then sulfur and acid rain, the reauthorization of the Clean Air Act in 1990, uh, led by our own Senator uh, Mitchell, uh, limited primarily sulfur, a little bit uh, nitrogen. At the time, that was going to wreck the American economy, by the way. Um, that didn't happen, uh, but we saw dramatic improvements. And if we look at these are maps are about 15 years apart from 1985 to 2009. And you see it, all you need to see from out there is that it was dark in 1985. Uh, not metaphorically, literally, relative to the map. Um, and it's gotten a lot lighter. There's a lot less uh, uh, sulfur deposition uh, because of the policies that were implemented. Uh, the, this is uh, sulfur deposition here in Maine from four long-running uh, deposition monitoring sites. Um, and they're from throughout the state. And what you see is overall about a 60% decline in sulfur deposition. Uh, I also plot, uh, when I show these figures on the bottom, that's Oregon at the bottom. Uh, so it doesn't mean that we're pristine by any means. Uh, but we've seen dramatic improvements uh, because of cost-effective policy. And I've been on some of the panels that have evaluated the benefit-cost ratio of the Clean Air Act. Um, and uh, it was uh, highly beneficial from an economic standpoint uh, with just human health, let alone ecological. So a lot of success stories, uh, more work to do. Uh, but that's not the topic of uh, today. The topic of today is what about climate change? And of course, um, we really haven't done anything significant uh, relative to the emissions uh, and the increasing concentrations of greenhouse gases. Uh, probably all of you have seen this and other plots that are similar to this. Uh, the Vostok ice core showing CO2 concentrations going back 800,000 years with, uh, on this graphic, uh, 2011 is the observed. Uh, probably a lot of you are aware that uh, in 2013 we broached 400 parts per million. Uh, in 2015, we'll probably chronically be above 400 parts per million um, with no change, uh, no bend in the curve uh, in sight. We take a look at, um, so before I go there, uh, sometimes some of you have heard me uh, talk about the end of climate change. Uh, it's not a cheery statement. Uh, it means that climate change is not uh, the environmental issue of the day and one quick policy is going to solve it. Uh, climate change will not go away. And mitigation is not adaptation. Uh, climate change, the political debate that we've heard a lot about over the last decade, to 10 to 15 years actually, um, has been really about mitigation, particularly on the national stage. And so now we live in an era where we both have to deal with mitigation uh, as well as adaptation. Uh, and adaptation and the need for adaptation won't change, uh, thus the kind of exercise that we're uh, going to go through today and learn about uh, uh, an approach to uh, addressing that need. Probably all seen this. These are trajectories of uh, CO2 um, from the recent IPCC report uh, with various scenarios, representative concentration pathways from um, really, really optimistic, uh, bending the curve, RCP 2.6 to um, the highest trajectory, RCP 8.5, that would give us by the end of the century uh, 5 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit um, increase in the global average temperature. And on this plot from the um, uh, global, uh, global Carbon Project, uh, it's got a 2014 estimate there, and you can see that we're on the highest trajectory. It's an estimate because, of course, we're still in 2014, so there's more to come. Um, but there's no reason to think that we're going to bend the curve, and there's no reason to think that this is going to go away anytime soon. I and feel compelled to point out when we talk about these trends, and, and uh, Paul has a wonderful graphic with a whole bunch of parameters uh, relative to our climate, our physical and chemical climate, uh, matched against uh, our population trend. So we all know that part of the driving force for the changes that we see is us. Uh, there's 7 billion of us on the planet. 
um, and there should be nine billion by the uh, middle of the century. Um, that had been the good news, that it was going to uh, at least taper off and uh, if we can catch up and figure out how to address this uh, as a global society, uh, maybe we'll be all right. Uh, a couple of months ago in science, uh, a paper came out uh, uh, analyzing UN data uh, suggesting the world population is unlikely to stop growing this century, um, peaking out somewhere between 9 and 12 billion. Uh, so the, the, the ultimate driving force, which is us, um, is, is not going to go away anytime soon as well. So what is climate change? Um, since I'm sort of first up, uh, we, sh we should start with a de definition of climate change. A nice short one uh, that says the same thing as some of the longer ones is that climate change is the long-term shifts in the statistics of weather. And that's important because uh, actually I think we're mostly beyond uh, pointing to last year versus this year as evidence that we're either warming or we're cooling. But nevertheless, uh, it's not the short-term interannual kinds of variations. It's the long-term uh, multi-decadal and, and longer kinds of trends in the uh, weather system. Uh, that is what we consider climate. And you can take any chunk, and that's what that little graphic shows, and you can show it's warming and it's cooling, uh, because it is uh, for those short-term periods of time. But that's not the longer-term trajectory uh, in the recent past. So what do we know about climate change from the standpoint of our global perspective? And this is what most of us see certainly what the national debate and, and discussion uh, focuses on. It comes from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that you're probably all familiar with. Uh, issues roughly every six years, uh, an assessment of climate change is an issue for uh, the globe. Uh, the most recent one came out uh, last year, uh, sen yeah, essentially this year and last year. So just about a year ago, uh, they're usually issued in three reports. The first one has to do with the physical climate, uh, which is the stuff we're talking about relative to temperature and moisture. Uh, the second one has to do, the second report in the series has to do with adaptation, and the third has to do with, uh, uh, with mitigation. Uh, and so what do we know on a global basis from that? Um, you know, the major trends are, no surprise, uh, warming temperatures, increasing storm intensity and st uh, storm surges, uh, melting glaciers, both uh, the land ice and the sea ice, um, warming seawater, rising sea level, and ocean acidification, which has to do with CO2 dissolving in ocean waters and essentially consuming the carbonate. Um, so, Clearly, climate is changing uh, in, the, in the last century that's having an effect uh, globally. Uh, but these are global averages. And so we continue to dig. Some of you, a lot of you are probably aware of uh, the national assessment came out this year. They come out every four years. This was the third national assessment. Um, they did a wonderful job. If you haven't visited it, I encourage you to do so. Uh, it's a great web presence, uh, very user friendly, lots of fun to dig through. Um, lots of good information across the spectrum of, of physical change, adaptation, and mitigation. Um, but that's the national scale. Um, it also includes regional assessments now. Uh, and so the last regional assessment was done in 2007. Uh, of course, Maine was part of it, but it was uh, regionally abased. And so why I lead you through this is this is where we've gotten our information uh, on climate change. But of course, um, this be piece of propaganda, uh, as you watch the little eye candy show up, um, is going to obviously remind us of what we think of as Maine. Uh, it's where we play, it's where we live, it's the natural resource bases uh, of our economy and our livelihoods. Um, and in our ego, we think, boy, anyone in the United States would look at this and say, that's Maine. I can tell because of all the things that you identify with it. Uh, they probably might get confused with uh, Paul Bunyan between Minnesota and Maine, but then hopefully the lobster boat and the blueberries would set them straight. <laughs> so it's these resources and how we interact with them and how we manage them and how we depend on them that we need to understand uh, how climate and the climate system, the changing climate system, informs that, uh, that dialogue. Uh, and at some level, uh, we get good perspectives from these broader scale reg uh, and regional uh, assessments. Um, but what we really need to know, uh, and what a lot of you really, really ask for, is what's happening in my backyard? Uh, that's what I need to know in order to make decisions. So um, we started to think about that here in the Climate, Inst Climate Change Institute back in around 2007, actually. 2008, Governor Baldacci asked us to lead the state assessment. Uh, a lot of you have seen it. Uh, you've already heard it mentioned this morning. Uh, Maine's climate future. We spent about a year 
uh, with over 70 scientists uh, from around Maine, uh, and of course a lot from uh, here at the university, uh, generously contributing of their time. Um, this was a zero-funded kind of activity, uh, but it's a classic kind of activity of why we uh, are, are uh, blessed to have a land-grant university that's in this kind of business, as well as uh, many, uh, many partners. And we did the assessment for the state of Maine. It talked about what do we know about climate change in Maine and how is it influencing some of our resources and how should we begin to, to think about that. That was delivered to the uh, legislature in 2009, in the winter of 2009. Legislature said uh, this is really good information uh, and what we need is to go forward with uh, adaptation planning. And so it charged Maine Department of Environmental Protection at the time uh, to go forward and do an initial one-year adaptation, uh, stakeholder adaptation uh, pr uh, process, uh, which was um, uh, led by people in the room here. Uh, and so on the right, what you see is the, uh, uh, the icon from the executive summary, people in nature adapting to a changing climate, and the table of contents for the much less colorful but much more uh, information-dense uh, report that was something like uh, eight, 70 or 80 pages, uh, talking about some of the low-hanging fruit of where to start on adaptation. That was delivered to the legislature um, uh, in 2010, and at the time, uh, the legislature said go forth and do a, a climate action plan that deals with adaptation uh, for, presumably at that time it was, would be for uh, 2012, which coincided actually with the, the uh, timeline for the existing mitigation uh, plan. Um, state government didn't pursue the activity of, uh, of leading that uh, larger statewide framework from there, but state agencies, NGOs, uh, federal agencies, uh, and lots of people out, uh, lots of you out in the communities have been uh, working pretty hard uh, in moving forward on, on climate adaptation ever since then. And so it doesn't mean that nothing's going on, there is uh, a lot going on, and hopefully today's discussion will, uh, will help inform that. Um, shameless advertising, we, we are working on a short update to Maine's climate future. It should be out at the beginning of, or in, in, in January, looking at uh, essentially asking the question of what do we know five years later um, that might be more refined in helping us uh, think about uh, how to move forward on adaptation. Uh, Maine has been a, a leader uh, on climate change issues for a long time. Uh, in 1995, we had the first statewide greenhouse gas inventory. In 2000, the State Planning Office drafted a climate action plan. 2001, Governor King joined with Northeastern governors and Eastern Canadian premiers, uh, agreeing to regional greenhouse gas reductions. Uh, and then in 2003, the Maine legislature enacted the first uh, law to uh, develop a, a climate action plan focused on mitigation, uh, of which all of the targets were met. Uh, the leaders of that are also here th th this morning. Uh, 2004, it became official with a timeline between 2004 uh, and 2012. Um, and then uh, 2007, Maine became the charter member of the Maine Climate Registry. Uh, and then 2008 leads on to the Maine Climate Future, which uh, I've already mentioned. So uh, we've been thinking about it for a long time as a state and, and in some ways very progressive. Uh, and particularly in some of the agencies, there's key people that have done uh, remarkable work in moving this uh, agenda forward. So when I think about this um, the outcome from the first report, we'll get to some of the, the, the specifics in a minute. Um, but I show this partly because, yeah, the, the conference today has some organization around the three climate zones. Uh, but I, I'm particularly taken with the importance of thinking about uh, our, our state uh, in regards to these three climate zones. Um, I did research, uh, I did the main gradient study in my program looking at biogeochemistry across these zones 20 years ago. So I've been aware of them and mindful of them for a long time. Uh, but it wasn't until I got involved more with some of the adaptation uh, di dialogues taking place throughout the state that I realized just how important it is to recognize and appreciate the cultural, economic, social, and natural resource differences that we embody. In fact, as uh, some of you will remember from the first report, uh, it was highlighted that we have as much climate variability across the state in four degrees latitude as you get in Europe across 20 degrees latitude from Poland to uh, northern Finland. Uh, and so that highly variable landscape, climate landscape and real landscape, um, is also responding to climate very differently, both from a physical standpoint as well as a social and economic standpoint. Okay, so. When I think about this, I think about three key questions, very practical uh, approach, um, to climate change relative to Maine. Uh, and the first question is, 
is there evidence of climate change in Maine? Is there any evidence that what we see in the IPCC reports happening around the world is in fact also happening here so that we should think about it? Uh, five years ago when I would say this, um, it was kind of revelatory what, uh, what the answer might be. Uh, of course, now you all know the answer to that uh, is yes. Uh, and so uh, we're going to take a look at a few of the indicators that uh, just give us uh, an idea of the kind of changes that we're experiencing. Um, a particular note of appreciation to Sean Burkle, who you'll uh, fortunate enough to hear a little bit later this morning, uh, Andy Pershing, uh, Joe Kelly, who contributed to these, uh, this information. And you'll hear more uh, when we do the update, or when we release the update. So Maine has increased temperatures. Uh, this is a 100-year record of uh, average temperature for the state of Maine. Lots of high-frequency variability. You see a lot of wiggle in the line. Uh, but the climate, you know, the long-term trend, unquestionably has been increasing over that period of time uh, by about three degrees. Um, I'm going to point out that, uh, and I'm red-green color deficient, so I'm not using this because I'm the only one in the room that can't find the dot usually. But, oh, yeah, I do see it. Um, you'll see, actually, there's a high-frequency high variability, and then there's a bit of a, a, a up and down that takes place here, and that has to do with uh, longer-term cycles, uh, uh, Atlantic multidecadal oscillation, actually, in this case, uh, 60 to 80-year cycle. We don't have time to get into sources of uncertainty in that scale uh, this morning, but um, that adds to the complexity of, uh, of predicting and understanding how uh, the climate will evolve uh, going forward. In addition to the warming, uh, we've had a, a differential in the seasonality of the warming, which is really important for a lot of the different natural resource areas in particular, uh, and actually for all of us. Uh, this is a plot of um, three average temperature by month, so it's a one-year cycle, average one-year cycle, uh, and the three colors, which I'm going to guess at, um, uh, are blue for about 100 years ago, um, orange, orange? Okay. Green, that's what I said. Uh, green for the present. Uh, and then red, thank you. Um, red for uh, 2050. And so those are kind of the projections that my wife's in the back of the room laughing right now. Um, those are the kind of projections that we're talking about. And the important take home here is we do have warming. Um, we have uh, some in the summer. Uh, we have the most warming that actually takes place in the winter. Uh, and that's really important because it's the t uh, winter lows that determine whether a plant can survive over the winter. Uh, it determines whether uh, certain pests can invade into new territories. Um, and the winter lows are, are driving those, uh, those temperature differences. And so you see 100 years ago, the average was 12 degrees in the winter. Now it's 15, and it's going to go up uh, by another 7 degrees uh, based on the model projections uh, by 2050. Uh, and a couple of degrees each of those uh, transitions if we look at the, the, the summer months. Uh, Maine's, uh, this is the, uh, a plot of the present temperature across Maine and um, uh, a lot more um, uh, spatial uh, detail in that from the broad climate zones. Uh, but you can see clearly that when we talk about these climate zones, um, there are, are distinct gradients uh, with a high degree of variability from point to point to point. Uh, so when some of you conti continuously and appropriately ask, I need a target, I need to know what we're planning for, um, that adds to the complexity of being able to do that. If we look forward uh, to 2050, the projections are for roughly in the coastal zone, three to three and a half degrees Fahrenheit increase. Uh, four to four and a half in the central zone, uh, and four and a half to five or greater uh, in, the, uh, in the northern zone. Maine has increased precipitation. Um, witness today's exhibit. Uh, we've had a trend of increasing precipitation, lots of variability. Precipitation is even more challenging than temperature uh, because you have all sorts of dynamics that can give you a pop-up storm here and not here, which we all have experienced, as well as a uh, big frontal system. So it's, it's a real challenge in order to uh, not understand the empirical record, because we measured it, uh, but to understand how do we project going forward, particularly uh, at fine uh, spatial resolution. We've had about a six inch increase in the total precipitation. So if you think it's wetter, it's wetter. Uh, or about 13% in, uh, increase throughout the state. Um, the projected increase going forward, again by the um, roughly these uh, climate zones, is somewhere between 2 and 3% along the downeast area, 4 to 5% um, 
uh, sort of in inland coastal, southern Maine and central, uh, up to 7% or more uh, in, the, uh, in the interior. Uh, and I know a lot of you are saying, mm, that's interesting, but that's not my problem. Your problem is uh, the extreme events, uh, which were scheduled today for illustrative purposes. Um, and, and this is a map that has plots of uh, accounts uh, that Sean put together um, of extreme events of two inches or more in decadal bins. So every bar is a 10-year a period over the last century. And if you just scan across it, which is the only thing that's intended here, you'll see that the last bar on the right is almost always, not always, but almost always uh, two, sometimes three times higher. Uh, the last decade has been phenomenal. We've had a lot more extreme precipitation events. We're not dreaming it. Um, and a lot of you I know are dealing with that from communities to towns to the Department of Transportation, what have you. Um, yeah, period. Maine has rising sea levels. Um, we've had rising sea levels for a long time, uh, for thousands of years, perhaps a, a tenth of an inch per decade. Um, but in the uh, last decade, it's increased dramatically. Uh, and as particularly all of you from coastal communities know, that rising uh, sea level creates all sorts of problems, uh, and we really notice it when storm surges come along uh, as to the implications of small changes in the average sea level upon which these uh, surges take place. Uh, and Maine has a warming Gulf of Maine uh, relative to sea surface temperatures. Uh, and this is a long-term plot, a 100-year plot. Uh, centered on the Gulf of Maine uh, that shows a sea surface temperature in Maine. And what you see is, again, a really noisy trajectory over time. Uh, but the long-term trend is for an increase. Uh, the long-term trend since 1900 is about 0.011 degrees Fahrenheit uh, per year uh, increase. Uh, and it speeds up. Uh, if we go to the last 50 years, it's about 0.035 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. And in the last 20 or 30 years, it's about 0.05 degrees Fahrenheit. Some of you have seen the press uh, on the possibility that the uh, Gulf of Maine is warming faster than 99% uh, of the world's oceans. And so this is having a really important effect. Um, this is also about truth in advertising. So uh, a really important aspect of looking at this figure is uh, this is 2012, which is probably burned in most of our minds at this point uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, an extreme event, but these things have happened before. Uh, the problem is they're on a rising background. So every time we get an event like this, but it keeps going up, uh, it pushes us into new terrain relative to uh, lots of different aspects of this dashboard, and in this case, um, um, sea surface temperatures. Some of the changes we see in the Gulf in 2012 with the warming and some of the changes we see chronically now happened back here um, when we had this warming. But of course, uh, they went away and it didn't get to the extent that it has uh, in the recent past. Uh, and then finally, ocean acidification. I'll have to admit, uh, af being a, a biogeochemist studying terrestrial acidification for decades and decades, um, uh, I'm, I'm a recent newcomer to thinking a lot more about ocean acidification. A really profound problem, a little different from the others, is a chemical problem. CO2 dissolves in seawater, consumes the carbonate. These fish uh, and other organisms depend on that carbonate. Uh, pH goes down and probably has all sorts of implications that we're just beginning to understand. Um, the way I, reason I left this as a question mark is we, have not, we don't have long-term records of uh, ocean acidification monitoring. Uh, and fortunately, um, in 2006, uh, the CO2 monitor uh, went in at the uh, Narracuse mooring off, off, off in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, and in 2010, uh, they added a pH sensor. So we're beginning to build that record. Uh, there's no question of what the trends are, uh, are globally. Uh, to Maine's credit, we have established, the legislature established a commission to look at ocean acidification, which I think has its report out, due out by the end of this calendar year, um, which will be extremely interesting. But this is an unfolding phenomena um, that also is part of the, the overall mix that has pretty profound consequences. So is there evidence of a changing climate? Yeah. Climate is changing in Maine in our own unique ways, and uh, it's what drives much of our uh, need to uh, think about adaptation. Uh, if climate's changing, uh, does it matter? Uh, so yeah, uh, it's changing, but it's really not affecting the way we do business. We always adapt to weather, so uh, we'll be fine. And I, I would suggest that's probably not the case. There are effects of uh, climate change in Maine, uh, and so we're going to talk about, um, depending on my timing, I'm keeping my eye on Misha. 
um, the, uh, some examples of how climate may be influencing uh, various sectors of our, our state. Uh, and in all these cases, um, there, uh, I look carefully to see that there's a component of it that has to do with climate change. It's not all about climate change, uh, but it is part of the mix. In some cases more, in some cases less, less and the rates of change are creating the problem. Um, so uh, we have warming waters. Uh, the 2012 event of peak temperatures caused dramatic changes in the uh, timing of molting with lobsters, which had to do with industry timing relative to markets. The prices crashed. Um, and uh, if we had three or four of those years in a row, uh, we would have been in, uh, in deep trouble. Nevertheless, uh, as we saw, warming of the Gulf is, is progressing. Uh, the center of gravity for the population of lobsters is moving north, and that has a profound effect on us. Uh, I think something like 60% of our fishery uh, intake is, is based on lobsters. Uh, warming waters increase invasives. Green crabs have gotten a lot of uh, attention. They damage um, uh, and, uh, shellfish and eelgrass. Uh, warming waters uh, can lead to uh, contribute to the collapse of fisheries. And last year we saw the uh, shrimp fishery closed. Increased runoff from these, these events uh, impacts productivity in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, it increases the rate at which pollutants and nutrients are washed out of the landscape. Uh, storm surges and sea level rise increases coastal erosion and, of course, invades our coastal communities and the high-value infrastructure that we have uh, built in those environments. Uh, estuaries and salt marshes that give us all sorts of uh, ecosystem services are at risk with a rising sea level, particularly when we have a built environment behind it uh, or it's up against the armored coasts of uh, the state of Maine. And saltwater intrusion as sea level rises into the freshwater resources that these communities depend on uh, is becoming increasingly important. In agriculture, um, they, we've seen the release in uh, 2012 of the new uh, plant hardiness zones by USDA. Actually, it was delayed for political reasons. Um, that's a map of Maine from the plant hardiness zone map. Those are really based on the winter minimums that determine what kind of plant materials can grow. Uh, in a particular area, but we have a longer growing season. Part of that can be good. Uh, we can both grow more and we perhaps can grow some new things. It also changes the dynamics so that when we get an early spring and uh, plant materials are up and growing and nice and tender and we get a late growing season frost, suddenly what used to be not so big a deal damages or destroys a crop for that year. And sometimes it happens to us and some other uh, area of the country benefits. Uh, sometimes it happens to them and we get better prices for our produce. Uh, warmer winter minimums have a lot of effects on all sorts of things. It increases the closeness to the freezing point, which allows us to have more frequency of these kinds of events. You don't have to think back far. Last Christmas we had the last ice storm, and many of us were around for the 98 ice storm, which was even more catastrophic. Um, a, a whole host of issues having to do with pests and pathogens, which many of which are uh, a component of what limits where they are and how they uh, interact with us uh, and with eco uh, ecological communities has to do with the bounding of the climatic conditions, either high temperatures or low temperatures, and those are changing, uh, oftentimes opening the door for new invasives. Um, the phenology of crops, you know, when we produce things, when the apples ripen, um, our systems are set up to know, okay, these are ripening now, and there's a market that expects them to happen. And when the phenology, the timing of when plants do what they do, and it's changing, and Esperanza will talk about a network that studies that, um, then sometimes we miss the mark. The lobster people uh, did that in 2012, um, and all the crops can do that depending on the seasonality uh, that's governing crop production. Soil moisture deficits, despite all this extra water, uh, there are still windows of time in the late growing season where the temperature now is getting higher, and if precipitation during that window doesn't change, we have an increased need to supplement soil moisture in order to maintain uh, productivity and, and uh, sustainability, economic sustainability um, of, that, uh, of that production. And so irrigation is part of a, a need both culturally as well as uh, from the standpoint of adaptation. Uh, there's increased crop uh, reliance on crop insurance. There's increased reliance on all the insurances, practically. Um, but crop insurance is an interesting aspect, and it's fundamentally part of our food systems. Um, and it differs for large growers and small growers, and it certainly differs for those who have it and who don't have it. And so as increased crop losses and disasters come along, um, it's having a, a pretty profound effect on, uh, on this component of the industry. And as I've alluded to, when something, when it happens, 
uh, when something happens somewhere else, uh, it can also affect Maine. It doesn't just have to be what happens here in Maine. Um, those are two maps of the uh, U.S. drought monitor. Uh, the upper one is 2013, where the drought was worst in the Midwest. Forced grain prices to go up. Those grain prices made it more costly for our dairy farmers to feed their cows, and it put some of them out of business. And so that was climate change effect somewhere else, but had a fundamental aspect uh, impact on Maine. And if we're not assessing and evaluating and predicting and, and planning for those things, we're going to get caught off guard. And of course, right now we're living through a record-breaking drought in the Western United States, uh, particularly in California, uh, one of our food-producing uh, centers uh, in the country. Uh, oh, and I always like to throw in the corn ethanol debate because it was the stupidest thing we could have ever done by, uh, by way of moving to that. It was not uh, uh, carbon, new, uh, carbon uh, positive. Um, and we're reeling back from that now. Uh, it's going to take us uh, 10 years or more to, to reel back from that. Affected food prices, 40% of the crop goes into ethanol. Uh, but uh, I mention it because it also shows that if we come up with the right kinds of policies and we get behind it, that wasn't one of them, but we do get behind it, we can make dramatic changes really quickly. And so uh, we've seen it in other environmental issues, we can see it in not so uh, good policy, uh, but we can make change fast as long as we get on the same page uh, and move forward. Um, so I'll speed up before I run out of time. Forest resources, uh, no surprise, we're 90% forested, uh, I'm a forest soils person. Uh, and so there's lots of implications for Maine forests. Uh, this is out of the 2009 document. The niche, the ecological environment in which trees grow and forests thrive uh, is shifting and some species are going to be favored, others are not. Trees are long-lived species and so um, we've got to make decisions now uh, and every day in our sort of cultural decisions and practices um, in anticipation of what it's going to be like 50 and 100 uh, years from now. And uh, some species will be favored, um, oak, pine, and others won't, uh, the spruce fir uh, forest being a classic example. Um, insects and disease, just like with agriculture, uh, changing climate creates all sorts of new gateways and new uh, concerns, uh, both for the species that we have uh, as well as new ones that we're we are thinking about and some that we're not thinking about because we've never seen them before, but suddenly now they'll, uh, they'll appear. Um, and if we look out west at the uh, pine beetle, it's devastated millions of acres in western Canada and the western United States here, um, which is just such an example with a, a, a climate-related uh, trigger. Uh, it's also been the fuel to, fi uh, to uh, underscore the megafires that, uh, that we see regularly in the western United States. Uh, this past year, there's been reports of pine, uh, pine disease. That's really a fungal disease. It doesn't have to do with warming. It has to do with so much extra precipitation that it makes it moist and damp, and the fung uh, fungal pathogens can survive. Um, operability, we don't like mud season uh, if we're out there harvesting. Uh, so we like to harvest on dry land in the summer or in frozen land. And the mud season's increasing. Um, the winter is getting shorter. Uh, and the roads that we use in order to get wood in and out of the, uh, out of the forest is impacted by the, these kinds of events uh, and issues of culverts. Culverts, 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 but uh, more on that later from Esperanza. Uh, uh, maple syrup, uh, obviously iconic for our region. Uh, part of that is the climate that we, we have. Some regions may benefit uh, relative to a longer maple syruping season. Uh, and of course, others, particularly at the southern range of that, uh, are going to drop off the map as, uh, as competitors in that market. And what happens elsewhere influences us here in Maine. So this is a map of the southeast. Uh, those that are forestry savvy know that they grow uh, lots of uh, trees really fast down there, uh, particularly yellow pine. Uh, but it's in the bullseye, along with California, of where drought stress is going to be, is and is going to be increasing rather dramatically. And so what happens to those, uh, that productivity influencing the markets that we compete in uh, are, is an example of the kind of important things to consider. Uh, human health, um, there's a few people out here uh, in the audience that have been uh, leaders in this regard. Uh, it, Lyme disease, of course, is the poster child for uh, a climate-related phenomenon that's really changed um, all sorts of aspects of how we think about and interact with our environment. Um, I know I do from, this, from my grandchildren playing out back to how we gear up to go out in the field to how we recreate in, in the great outdoors. Um, uh, we've gone from 100 to over 1,300 cases in the last 10 years. These are the reported cases. Um, and essentially every county in the state uh, has reported cases of, uh, of Lyme disease. 
uh, heat stress, rep respiratory stress. Uh, we haven't really built an environment, uh, a, a made environment, uh, around it being really hot. This is not New Orleans. This is Maine. Um, and so when we get high heat events, there's a lot of people that aren't prepared, don't have air conditioning, those kinds of things. Um, that little plot that you're not intended to read, it's intended to remind me to uh, say that we're roughly about four, uh, four uh, days per year above a heat index of 95 now, uh, and that's anticipated to go up to 10 or more uh, by the time we get to 2050. So we've seen this trajectory of change, uh, and we'll see more of it to come. Ozone and smog, ozone's gotten better. Uh, relative to air pollution, but the interaction between ozone and the high heat means that it still now uh, creates a, a, a respiratory and a cardiac uh, issue. Uh, allergies, if you think your allergies bug you more, um, I think maybe they do. Uh, we have a longer pollen production season. CO2 can increase the rate of pollen production, um, and so uh, that too is changing. And of course, disaster relief in communities having to do with human health. Uh, I'll point out, uh, this is a document that's about 15 years old, uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility, Death by Degrees, dealing with climate change and human health. Uh, and an update is due uh, sometime, uh, I won't put Norm on the spot, but sometime in uh, 2015 that uh, we all should look forward to that will be a really important assessment uh, of what we know today. Uh, linkages in Maine, I'll be a little quicker now. Uh, biodiversity and wildlife, where they live, how they live, uh, a lot like trees, the niche is changing. And some of our iconic species like salmon, moose, and loon uh, are, are known for who we are, or we're known for, for them, um, but part of who we have been has to do with our climate, and in some cases they're uh, under threat. Uh, decreasing snow cover, changes in ranges, uh, a lot of dynamics. I'll point to a, a report out last year by uh, Manomet, a uh, really uh, excellent uh, assessment of the vulnerability of various species for, from uh, microorganisms to mammals that, uh, that addresses this uh, concern. Uh, recreation and tourism, uh, the icon of that being uh, less snow, uh, so snowmobiling and skiing and uh, those industries are uh, obviously uh, in, being impacted by the changing dynamics of our climate, but um, you know, every fish and game season is based on what? The seasons. Uh, and we haven't, we're not reevaluating. does that make sense? Because in some cases they're not. There was, I think, one bill in the legislature last year for one particular component of it, uh, but not a comprehensive evaluation of how uh, that should uh, be addressed. Uh, and seasonality, both good and bad. You know, we've got the wing seasons, the springs and the falls that are now significantly longer and perhaps new opportunities. Okay. Uh, Mises giving me the sign. Uh, town, cities, and infrastructures, and a lot of you are experts on this. I'm not going to say much about. Uh, you're going to hear some uh, from the fantastic work that Esperanza and her colleagues are, are doing, but uh, particularly managing uh, this stuff, uh, storm events and, and flooding, what have you, is uh, a particular concern. Uh, and uh, I, if I've learned anything about a, a topic more than uh, most in the last uh, five years or to ten years, it, it has been culverts, and you'll hear more about them shortly. Uh, and then national security. Uh, of course, uh, our president already mentioned it. Uh, we're part of the United States, and it's our sons and daughters that go out and serve in the military uh, and do so proudly, uh, which we appreciate. Um, but uh, what the uh, military is faced with is a whole host of new challenges throughout the globe. Uh, last week, the Department of Defense came out with this report. Uh, 2014 Climate Change Adaptation Roadmap. This isn't new. The Department of Defense has been actively involved with climate adaptation for a long time, even when it wasn't politically correct, depending on who was in the White House. Um, but this is a most recent assessment, and I can't uh, claim to have read all the details, uh, but an important uh, recognition of all of these kinds of threats and challenges uh, that we face around the world. That little picture at the bottom, this report reminded me of a a couple of years ago, an editorial in the New York Times by Tom Friedman making the linkage between uh, drought in the Mideast and grain prices, uh, food shortages, and the Syrian uprising. And so uh, I think uh, there are lots of um, uh, fascinating interactions between uh, national security and, and climate. So um, the final question is, what do we do about it? That's part of why we're all here today. That's what a lot of you are engaged in. Um, I call it, for short, adaptation. Uh, in keeping with my uh, academic pedigree, uh, let's look at a definition. Uh, from IPCC, climate change adaptation is the adjustment in natural and human systems in response to actual and expected climatic stimuli or their effects, which moderates harm <coughs> or exploits beneficial opportunities. Um, and again, um, it's not all bad. Um, there are opportunities here. 
um, uh, relative to uh, all sorts of uh, aspects of, uh, of the main economy. But um, the, the risks and the increasing risks are, are uh, large. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, a figure that conceptually represents uh, what adaptation process might look like. It's out of the National Climate Assessment uh, uh, this past spring. Um, it's not particularly the most attractive, but um, it does a job. And basically, they all look like this, and they all talk about um, this process. The ones I have circled have to do with the kinds of discussions that will probably go on today relative to the scenario planning that, uh, that we're going to be learning about. Um, but we start out with identifying the issue, gathering information, doing risk assessment, developing a strategy, implementing, monitoring the effect of that strategy, and monitoring the changes in the environment, feeding that all back in and getting better and better at doing that. Um, and so uh, hopefully we continue to improve uh, and create a process to move that forward. So the take-home messages. This is not the result of some tribunal. This is just me. So you can just blame me. Uh, number one, few of these challenges are just about climate change. I'm not saying my hair is on fire because of climate change. Uh, I'm saying climate change is a part of a lot of what's going on, a lot of the challenges, particularly the new challenges, and often climate change is kind of the great threat multiplier. Um, but figuring out what's going on and why is complex, uh, and climate change is in, an increasingly important component of it. Uh, climate change represents both risks and opportunities. Uh, but this is not like one of those telev split-screen television things with two opinions. Um, my perception is that the risks are uh, significantly larger at this point in time than the opportunities, but we should pursue both uh, aggressively. Solutions of the 20th century will not work in the 21st century, or may not. I hope I said often will not work. Good. Uh, in the uh, 21st century. And why do I say that? Two reasons. Number one is, uh, everything we did, particularly in a land-grant environment that uh, I've always lived in, um, we think we figured things out, we have management plans, what have you, but we did that in the 20th century with the 20th century climate. We'll never see the 20th century climate again, probably not in our lifetimes. Uh, and so we really need to critically rethink how much we actually think we know and how successful it will be about moving us forward. In addition, society has changed. and so. We pass through the filter of sustainability a lot of what we think about doing. And so if we think we're going to solve the food problem like we did in the last century, we fix nitrogen uh, at the beginning of the last century, two out of five people on the planet are due to the ability to fix nitrogen from the atmosphere, create fertilizer, and grow uh, a lot more food. Um, but uh, that comes with a lot of economic environmental consequences, and that, that general approach would not be uh, acceptable. So in the 21st century, we need to also pass the filter increasingly uh, of sustainability. Um, three more. Do not overrate uncertainty. Um, it's very hard to predict the future. All models are wrong. Some are useful. And so we look to models for guidance. We look to science. We should base our decisions on the very best science, um, but there are no absolutes. And so we have to think about balancing risk assessment by various approaches, like scenario planning, in order to move forward. I'm down to five minutes. I'm almost there. Uh, Maine deserves a coordinated framework for adaptation. Uh, I think we deserve a Maine climate action plan that addresses both mitigation and adaptation for the 21st century. Uh, repeatedly, we see the need for um, uh, increased coordination because of so many things happening in so many places uh, with what I'll call imperfect communication. So let's do this in the most cost-effective way possible. And to do that, we need a, a, an overriding framework. And then finally, a quote from Alan Kay from early in the, uh, worked for Apple at the time, uh, in the 1970s, uh, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. In other words, others have said similar things, uh, but we can sit around and wring our hands or we can say, well, we're not absolutely sure, let's wait and see. Uh, meanwhile, we know things are changing and they're having a consequence. So let's do everything we can to move forward to have the best future for us and particularly our children and our grandchildren uh, on the issue of climate change. And so with that, Let's get started. Um, we have time for a couple of questions, if there are any. Yes, there is coffee at the break. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so um, Dan Dixon, uh, 
Dr. Dixon from the Climate Change Institute and the University Sustainability Office. He and I, the plot that he asked about the metals in the Sergeant Mountain Pond core, uh, they went up and then they went down. Uh, and when my good friend Steve Norton gave me the plot, I said, so why does it do that? Uh, and it does that because right at the surface, it's kind of loose because it's the interface with the water and it's mixed up. Uh, and so the density there is not accurate. So that's not an accurate chronological record. Uh, so you, that's why it's grayed out to ignore it. But good question. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, they have a question about CO2 projection. You know, another big thing going on is possible depletion of uh, fossil fuels. When people pre uh, try forecasting CO2 levels and temperature rises, do they assume that fossil fuel extraction stays more or less constant? Do they try to address different scenarios when it peaks and possibly declines over the next few decades? So, like, you're asking what assumptions do they make about CO2 projections in the IPCC projection uh, yeah, of what, the, what assumption they make about underlying fossil fuel availability, you know? Most of that comes out of burning oil and coal. You oh, cannot yeah. assume that it will be burned at the same rate forever because you know it's getting depleted whether we like it or not. Right. Well, I'm not sure the answer to part of that. The projections are done on various assumptions. That's what those representative concentration pathways give you uh, model projections at, at different levels of CO2. On the issue of sort of fossil fuel availability. Uh, I'm not sure if this is what you were getting at, but uh, and I, I, had to, I had to cut slides out of here so Lisa wouldn't get angry at me. But one of them had, was the annual International Energy Authority report that I like to look at their executive summaries, and it's gone from saying uh, in 2012, if we use more, any more than a third of our fossil fuel reserves, we're cooked and we'll never broach, uh, we'll never meet, meet the uh, two degree centigrade target, to in 2013, it basically said, um, we can't use any more than a third, and we're still not going to ever meet uh, the two degree target. So the point being is, we've got lots of fossil fuel capability, um, and, and we simply cannot use them. So if that was part of the question, there's not a fossil, we're not going to hit peak oil. That's not going to happen. We're never going to see that. We've got the other kind of problem, is we've got to figure out how not to use them. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Standing between you and coffee. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just to answer a little bit more about that question, I think everybody realizes that one of the big unknowns is methane, uh, and methane release as a consequence of warming is increasing f much faster than people thought it would. It's 30 to 60 times more effective. Um, so rather than, as Ivan said, stand in between you and uh, coffee, I'll just make a couple of quick comments. Number one, Ivan gave a phenomenal presentation. Uh, what he did was to help us understand, which we all try to do in the, in, in the way we speak to other people, how this issue has gone from something that was really revolved around what the temperature would be in 2100, which didn't necessarily captivate people as much as how this ab absolutely is already impacting us down on the ground uh, today in so many different ways. And the additional dimension that even if you're thinking about it in a local area, what happens at the regional to global scale uh, is critically important. So thank you, Ivan. You did a remarkable job of presenting that. So um, in 2008, we had uh, uh, the, uh, the climate change of the 21st century here at the University of Maine. The purpose of that was to demonstrate how broad the reach of climate change is. Uh, and it included not the obvious things like science and policy, but it also included art, the arts, music, sculpture. It was really a remarkable uh, display of, of, the, of the, the broad reach. Uh, I mention this because we have a very small number of examples 
of the type of research that's being done by graduate students at the University of Maine. We just put a few out because the purpose of this meeting is really to give you an overview of where Maine's climate future is, give you the tools, et cetera. But as you go in for coffee, you will see uh, a few posters out there. Please take a look at them. They're a very small uh, example of what is being done already uh, in the state of Maine related to climate change by our graduate students. And you'll also see a poster out there that deals with abrupt climate change. Uh, because of the efforts of Jasmine Saros, who's a professor in School of uh, Biology and Ecology and also associate director of our institute, we have a program here called Ad uh, Adaptation, uh, 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 oh, A2C2. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Actually, I came up with the title, but I can never remember it. Thank you so much. Anyway. So we have, uh, we will have by uh, the end of next year, 25 PhD students, one of them is Jessica, who has a much better memory than I do, uh, uh, going through this program. It's a shared program with the School of Policy and International Affairs, and it is intended uh, to take physical, chemical, biological, and social scientists, put them uh, together, and, and have them think about how quickly the climate can change, uh, particularly the concept of abrupt climate change, which will become a very important component of this meeting, as you'll find out uh, later on. Please take a look at what abrupt climate change is. They put together a great introductory poster uh, describing it. Please have a good time at coffee. Uh, we will recollect here a little bit after 9.45. Thank you.